All right, uh, quick check. Everyone hear me all right? Yep, I got you. All right, awesome, awesome. Well, uh, welcome everyone to our first ever tournament talks. Oh, I guess, uh, let me just double check. Everyone's got the attendees, everyone's open. Okay, perfect. Yes, welcome everyone to our first ever tournament talks. Uh, my name is Sean Simmons. I'm president and founder of Anglers Atlas and MyCatch. And the purpose for the tournament talks tonight is uh, for us to share some of the research that's being done from the data we're collecting from anglers like yourself who are out there catching fish and recording them through my catch. Uh, I'll start with a little bit of background about Anglers Atlas. I started it over 20 years ago with the goal of sharing free fishing maps to anglers. And we've now cataloged well over a quarter million lakes and rivers and oceans across the country uh, sharing maps with anglers. Uh, in 2018, three years ago, uh, we started uh, MyCatch, the app, with the purpose of being able to collect data for fisheries science research. And it's uh, set up as a log book, so you can catch your, uh, or record your catches right on the app. And uh, that data gets shared confidentially with, uh, uh, with fisheries researchers under strict conditions that secret spots stay secret. And that is an um, uh, unbreakable rule, and we take that very seriously. Now, where the tournaments come into this is uh, last spring when COVID hit and a lot of the tournaments got canceled across the country, we realized that we had a, a tool that uh, would be able to be used as a virtual uh, tournament uh, simply by using the camera uh, and the GPS to take pictures of the fish on a measuring device. And so we started running tournaments uh, last spring. Our first one was uh, uh, partnership with uh, the Striper Cup on the Miramichi River out east. And over the course of the season, we ran a total of 14 tournaments, uh, including the three walleye wars that uh, we ran in Saskatchewan. Now, um, part of uh, what we're trying to do here uh, for the talk is to really take some of this data that we're collecting that informs us on the state of the fisheries uh, uh, it's particularly in this case in Saskatchewan, and work with researchers so that they can share some of that data back. And as much as it's about us sharing information with you, it's also about us learning from anglers, in particular, what type of information you're looking for, what would you like to see happen with the data. So that's a really important part of what we hope to get out of these tournament talks. Now, uh, the agenda for this evening is I'll stop talking fairly shortly, and I'll pass it on to Dallas Kirkpatrick. He was the person that envisioned Walleye Wars and has been uh, running it and, and pushing it uh, through our system uh, over the last uh, six or so months. And he'll share a little bit about what's happening with the Walleye Wars uh, and, and what we're planning for 2021. Uh, then I'll pass it over to Dr. Chris Summers from the University of Regina, and he'll share some of the research that he and his team have been doing in Saskatchewan, specifically working with a number of tournaments uh, in Saskatchewan. And uh, after that, uh, we'll have Shana Hamilton uh, share some of the results from Walleye Wars. What's some of the data that we actually were able to collect and, uh, and learn from uh, through the course of this season. And finally, we'll wrap it up with uh, uh, some Q&As and uh, Chelsea Crandall will be moderating that section. Uh, so I guess I just want to re-emphasize, uh, it's very important that we learn from the anglers here. So there's a chat feature and, and uh, you may you have to activate it. I think it's at the bottom of your screen, there'd be a chat uh, feature. So if you can click on that chat feature to open up the chat. And what we are asking is if you have any questions uh, that arise anywhere through the talk or any comments or want to contribute any of your thoughts, please enter it in the chat box because that's how we're going to be able to uh, communicate back and forth with everyone watching the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to pass, uh, pass it on to Dallas Kirkpatrick. He's a director of sales with Anglers Atlas, and as most of you know, an avid uh, walleye angler in Saskatchewan. Dallas, uh, take it away. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Sean. Um, just a quick note, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my best to be brief. I'm not known for being very good at that, but I'll do, do my best. Um, I wanna cover four things quickly. Uh, just gonna recap the three walleye wars tournaments that we did. Uh, I want to talk about the story kind of behind Walleye Wars, how it came to be and, and what, what the goals are there. The, the third thing would be um, the goals of the series, what we're trying to achieve by uh, using this new technology and this, new, this totally new format that none of us were really used to prior to this year. 
And then the final thing is just kind of a sneak peek into the future. Um, as you can probably guess, I get asked a lot of questions about next year and, and beyond. So I'm going to provide a little bit of insight there, which I think is probably the part that people want to hear most about. But um, before we get into the, the good stuff with the science afterwards. So just a quick recap. Um, most of you know a lot of this, but just for those who came in kind of after things got started, uh, we did three walleye wars tournaments in 2020. The first one was only 24 anglers and it wasn't an open invitational. Um, those were handpicked tournament anglers that, uh, you know, people I knew and, uh, you know, from the tournament trails and, um, it, it really wasn't, you know, the, the one regret I have about that is that some people assume that that was meant to be the top 24 anglers in Saskatchewan. Uh, it was never meant to be that, but it was supposed to be a good mix of people, of tournament anglers who, um, you know, we could test some of this stuff on and, and people that were willing to do it. And, and there was a few that, you know, that uh, couldn't participate for whatever reason as well. So the first one we did 24 anglers, it was one month. So it was the entire month of August from August 1st to 31st. Um, it was a winner take all $5,000 prize, which was eventually won by Glenn Bomey. So uh, congratulations to Glenn for that one. He won the first tournament and it was, his fish was the biggest fish of the, of Walleye Wars for the year up until the very last day of Walleye Wars 3. So I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, Walleye Wars 2, was a little bit different. It was, it served as a pre-fish tournament for uh, the last mountain fall walleye classic. And it was kind of co-organized with, with Doug Kramer. Um, and that tournament ended up having 61 participants. Although we did allow uh, last mountain anglers to fish that with their, their last mountain partner. So it actually was more than 61 people, but it was 61 different entrants for that event. And it was a one week tournament instead of one month. It ran from September 3rd to September 10th. And the total prizing or, uh, for that was, it was again a winner take all, $3,100 ended up being the total take, count, which take home, which was won by uh, Renee Sen and Dave McKenzie. And I believe I saw Renee's name on here earlier. So thanks for coming on, uh, Renee. And the third tournament, which was kind of the, uh, the big one that, that everything led up to, was it was based on the Walleye Wars 1 format. The biggest difference being it was a lot more anglers and it was uh, wide open so anyone um, could enter. And we had a goal of 100 anglers, so we capped it at 100. We ended up with 95, so, you know, pretty happy with 95%, uh, you know, only two months after the first tournament started. So that tournament was a three-week tournament. Um, so you can tell we've been playing with the format a little bit, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But that tournament ran from October 9th, so Thanksgiving weekend, to November 1st. The total prizing for that event ended up being over $20,000, and it was top 10 paid, plus additional prizing for that one. And uh, Mike Angler ended up winning that one on the very last day, so that was pretty exciting. And that his fish ended up being the biggest fish of the season for, for Walleye Wars. So congratulations to Mike. And uh, that is basically what we've done up until this point. I'm not going to talk too much about Walleye Wars 4, which starts in uh, just a little over a week here. It's the ice fishing tournament, um, but I will touch on that kind of at the end. But I wanted to spend the time recapping the three that we've done. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the story kind of behind it. So obviously we we're filling a void left by the pandemic. Um, at the time that Walleye Wars 1 started, there was no, no fishing tournaments in Saskatchewan. Um, for me, I, obviously I didn't fish these tournaments. So this was the first year since I was six that I didn't fish, fish a tournament. So that kind of sucked, but it was nice that we did get to uh, get involved in, the, in this side of things. So um, the, as I mentioned before, the first tournament had the 24 handpicked anglers and that was done to test the format. Like I said, this is a pretty radically different format than we're used to. And we also wanted to test the app technology. Um, Sean mentioned at the start that the app has been around for three years now, but it wasn't originally designed to be a tournament app. So we kind of, you know, we had this idea more than a year and a, a year ago, and then fast forward to the start of COVID, it kind of became a priority for us to get the ball rolling on that. And that's how we ended up, you know, with the ability to do that this summer. But, and Walleye Wars wasn't our first event with my catch, but it was, it was the first pretty significant one and first big one. So, um, you know, there was a lot of learning that had to 
go in there. But that's why we kept that first tournament deliberately small, uh, both to build momentum for the future, but also, you know, it, it had, there was going to be some hiccups and there was, and, and everybody handled it really well. So I have a lot of appreciation for those 24 guys that helped us out. And, and a lot of them ended up participating in the second and third event as well. So um, the other thing is that we, we, as I touched on earlier, we kind of deliberately played with the format. Um, you know, we, we kind of always saw this, especially after the first couple of weeks of the first tournament, it was pretty evident that there's a market for this. People want to do this. Um, you know, spoiler alert, I guess, but it's not going to go away. Uh, we're going to continue with Walleye Wars, but we kind of knew that pretty early on. So we, we used these three tournaments to kind of see um, what worked and what didn't, what format people were comfortable with. Um, you know, I know that there were some questions raised throughout um, why you're doing it this way, why are you doing it that way? And it, it was done deliberately to try and to see what works and what doesn't. So that's why each tournament was kind of different. Um, and it, there'll be a lot similar in the future, which I'll get up to in a second here, but that's kind of the backstory behind Walleye Wars and how it became or how it, uh, how we ended up where we are today. So, uh, this is an important one I wanted to talk about was the goal of Walleye Wars, more so than just us running a tournament and having a new event and having a, the new shiny toy. Um, first and foremost thing, and I've said this to a lot of people, but this Walleye Wars was never meant to be to compete with the SWT or the CWT or the SAWT, any of those, like it's meant to be a complimentary series. It's, we're not, I have no interest in going head to head with anyone. Um, that's why the schedule was what, where it was. We didn't overlap with any existing major events and we, I don't have any plans to do that moving forward. Um, it's also supposed to be, a big part of it for me is um, kind of lowering that barrier of entry for, for fishing tournaments. I think anybody listening to this call probably knows that uh, the barrier to entry for fishing tournaments is pretty significant. Um, I'm very lucky to you know, have grown up with it and have had a, had a dad who, who's been a part of that forever. But, you know, all of us who fish tournaments know there's very few people my age that, uh, that are involved in tournaments. It's kind of the, the tournament crew has aged, uh, you know, as the tournaments have aged because it's, it's just so hard to get into both from a financial point of view, um, you know, the time commitment, it's a very expensive hobby as we all know. So, this was kind of meant to, Wally Wars is kind of meant to be uh, in the in-between where, yes, the season tournament anglers can fish it, and, and a lot of them have, but also we can get, introduce some new people to tournaments and kind of get them into it. And I see, uh, you know, Ian, even in just the tournaments we've done up to this point, there's been several people that have mentioned to me that, you know, they're now excited to look at doing SWT tournaments, and, and that's kind of, um, you know, in a way we're working with them not against them so that was a really important part of it for me um the other thing is the 250 dollars entry fee so it, this is does not apply to the ice fishing tournament because we went a different route with that one that's kind of i'm treating that as kind of a one-off but 250 dollars. the reason that number was chosen was because as we all know it's significantly less than your typical um you know regular two-day event but it's also high enough that it allows us to have significant prizing. Like uh, Mike Angler took home just shy of ten thousand dollars for his first place finish in Walleye Wars Three. So it's it's enough to uh, you know for people to get out there and put the effort in. But it's not the entry fee isn't so high enough that there's a barrier to entry, just like you know a lot of the other tournaments. So that that is kind of the number we started with, and I I think we're going to stick there because it's gone pretty well. And then the, the big thing I wanted to, or the big story I wanted to tell here too, and, and some people have noticed this and messaged me already, but um, along with that barrier to entry, you know, we're trying to promote that you can do this from anywhere, you know, it, you can do it in a scenario that works best for you. And with Walleye Wars 3, which was our big tournament, um, five of the top 10 money earners, those fish were caught from shore, including Mike's the winner. So that kind of proves our theory right there is that you can do well in these events without having the $100,000 boat and the $80,000 truck, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, you can win a Walleye Wars from shore and it's already been done in the first year. So that's, that's a really uh, a big part of the story that I wanted to tell just because it, it really kind of, I think it's really gonna, 
lend itself to getting people more involved and getting more people out there and getting people involved in competitive fishing. And that was an important part of it for me. So um, the last little bit here, just want to talk about the future. Uh, I get asked a lot about what the plans are. So I'm going to tease that a little bit. Um, I, I was hoping to have a little bit more nailed down at this point to share. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton, but I will, I will share what I have. So the, mo the question that I get asked more than anything else by far is when do you come and tell Berta? When do you come and tell Berta? When do you come and tell Berta? Um, I wanted to be able to say it's for sure, but there's uh, very strong plans in place. The plan for next year or for, for this year, I guess, 2021, is to, we want to have a, at least a couple of events in Alberta, a couple in Saskatchewan, and a couple in Manitoba. And that's, that's kind of our goal for this year. Um, the reason I can't say that that is going to happen for certain is because every province, we, we don't run events that aren't licensed. So um, every province has their own set of restrictions and every province requires a CFE, which has its own set of rules and hoops to jump through in, in order to get that. Um, unfortunately for us organizers, the Alberta is one of the tougher ones for sure. There's a lot that needs to go right to run an event there. But, um, you know, we got, we have Jim on our team out of Calgary, who's one of the founders of the SAWT. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we can get something set up there for sure. So it is definitely a top priority for us, but I can't say for certain. But uh, the plan is to have a couple of events across each Prairie Province for next year. That's kind of the big news. Um, in terms of the format, and this was dictated both by what we learned and by the survey that was sent out to all of the walleye wars, one, two, and three anglers. Um, we want to stick to where possible province-wide. That proved to be really popular. It's, it's radically different than everything else. Um, the fishing pressure is spread out. It really lends itself to what we're trying to do with making it accessible. Um, you don't necessarily have to travel six, seven, eight hours to fish. You can you can fish to your where it makes sense for you. And that's that's really been a, a key, you know, that was kind of a no-brainer for us. So uh, whenever possible, we're going to be doing province-wide events. And that's the plan moving forward as long as we're able to get those, the proper licensing, which we are in, in Saskatchewan for sure. So we know that much for certain. Uh, the $250 entry fee is going to stay. That's the number that we are comfortable with. And that's the number that, uh, you know, that was pretty much a unanimous answer in the survey was everybody was happy with that. It, like I said before, it allows for good prizing, but also, um, you know, it's not so much that a lot of people are going to not partake because of it. So, and then the other one is the 100 anglers. Uh, that's what we shot for with Walleye Wars 3. We were very happy to get 95% full. Um, I don't, there's not a strong reason to, to raise that right now, especially with increasing the number of events and increasing the scope across three provinces. So moving forward, it's going to be $250 entry fee, uh, province wide where possible, uh, hundred angler events. And then the, the big thing that is changing, uh, and this, I can say, you know, with a fair degree of certainty is that we're moving to a 10 day format. So the biggest thing that we played with tournament to tournament was the length. There was a month, a week, and three weeks. And um, for various reasons, we're going to go with 10 days as our standard. And that's going to be Friday to the following Sunday. So it's essentially two weekends with a week in between. And, uh, you know, there's been, there's been comments of people who, you know, I can't compete with the retired guys that can fish for 20 days in a row or, um, you know, it's better that it's longer because it allows people to go out so that you're kind of got two competing things there. And that uh, having two weekends with the week in between is is going to be the sweet spot for us. So it's going to be, they're going to be 10 day tournaments moving forward with two weekends. So hopefully that uh, everybody's happy with that and we'll get some feedback on that shortly. But um, that's pretty much concludes what I wanted to talk about. I'm going to stick around obviously for for questions and stuff like that. But what this is really about is the science. So I'll pass it back to Sean and we can get that ball rolling. Yeah, thanks for that, Dallas. Yeah, really exciting. We're looking forward to all the tournaments we're going to get to run next year. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Summers uh, from the University of Regina. He's a professor in biology. Uh, he started the Saskatchewan Sport Fish Research Group in 2016 and has had a lifelong interest in fisheries, both in the biology, the management, as well as an active angler, and particularly interested in what happens to the fish after you release them. Chris, off to you. 
Thank you very much, Sean. I'll share my screen here. All right, I uh, just wanted to start by thanking the uh, Anglers Atlas folks for inviting me out tonight to have a chance to, uh, to speak to everybody. And my plan is uh, I'm going to give just an overview of our catch and release uh, fish tagging program. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the um, types of data that we're collecting and what kinds of questions we try to answer with it. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, new stuff to do with ice fishing and uh, hopefully that will generate some material for uh, the, the chat conversation. Uh, when I'm finished talking about tagging, I am then going to turn it over to Shana Hamilton, who has been helping me with uh, winter fish research for a number of years now. And uh, she's gonna talk a bit about um, basically best practices for, for winter catch and release. So uh, before I go on to the uh, actual science part, I think a lot of folks will probably know me better uh, behind my uh, Facebook persona, which is the Saskatchewan Sport Fish Research Group. Uh, we post uh, a lot of stuff about uh, research on this Facebook page uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. And if folks are interested in more about what we do, that's a great place to go and check out uh, uh, some of the things I'm talking about today. So at the University of Regina, we have two major types of fish tagging programs ongoing. We do active tagging and passive tagging. Uh, I'm going to talk about active tagging just for a second here, and then for the rest of the night, I'm going to talk about passive tagging. So active tagging is when we put a transmitter, uh, a device of some sort on or in a fish, and that device will broadcast a signal that we can use to, uh, to track. So that's the active part, and that allows us to do things like uh, produce a map like this one, which shows uh, an area near a tournament way station on Lake Diefenbaker, and the heat map that you see on the screen there. Uh, warmer colors mean more uh, fish presence in that area. And you can kind of see some yellow dots there that show how the fish start to spread out uh, after a certain amount of time has passed. So that's uh, active uh, tagging and tracking. Uh, that's one form of, of study that we do, very uh, resource intensive, uh, but it's passive tagging that I want to talk about today. And passive tagging is basically uh, giving each fish a unique ID code on a plastic tag that you can find on the fish somewhere. And in this case, we use something called T-bar tags. And this young walleye that I'm holding in the picture, you can see has a blue T-bar tag uh, near its second dorsal fin. And uh, that fish is caught, tagged, some information is collected and it's released. And uh, then we wait for a recapture and uh, that's how the, the passive tagging works. So there's no signal being broadcast by this type of tag. So we tag a variety of different fish species in different contexts in Saskatchewan. So we tag walleye, northern pike, yellow perch. Um, we use different colored tags sometimes. Uh, we use different styles of tags in terms of what's printed on them. But always there's going to be a unique ID number for the fish that links it to a database entry. And there's going to be some information on the tag about how to report most often it is an email address like the one you see in the bottom left part of the screen here. So each fish comes with its own unique ID and a way to report uh, information uh, when you catch one. And we do some, um, I guess, weirder species for lack of a better term. Uh, we only have one largemouth bass fishery in Saskatchewan. We have tagged fish uh, for that. And we do some of the um, quote unquote rough fish like Cisco and suckers that uh, anglers are less interested in, but as a fish biologist, I'm still very interested in. And probably my favorite species is, uh, is burbot. And you see the tag on the back of the burbot here. And so we have a, a lot of tags on a lot of different species out there. And again, the, the goal is to collect information about them at the time that they're caught, uh, give them a unique ID number, and then put them back in the water and wait for information to come in from those fish when anglers recapture them. So that's the mark recapture nature of the program. So what kinds of things can we learn from T-bar tags? Great thing about T-bar tags is they're relatively cheap and, and fairly straightforward to uh, put on the fish. And they can allow us to learn things about the fate of fish after catch and release. So does the fish live or die? Uh, they can tell us something about movement. So we're we release the fish in a known location and it's caught and reported it in another location, we can infer movement from that. Uh, we can learn how many times the same fish is recaptured. 
And uh, we can kind of extrapolate that out to understand how important catch and release is as a conservation and management strategy. And we also have metrics uh, on the fish when we tag it. And if the angler collects information on its length and weight at the time that they recapture it, we can compare those two things and uh, we can get an idea of how fish are growing um, between capture events. So today what I'm going to do is Let's give you some examples of data that we've generated uh, largely from tournaments that deal with the first three of these. So fate movements and uh, times recapture. Probably my favorite aspect of this whole program is that it allows uh, an open door of communication between scientists and anglers. In fact, we draw anglers into the program and basically turn them into the scientists. And as an angler myself, I really appreciate this part of it because I think all anglers are armchair biologists, right? We're all sitting there at all times scheming about how to best um, fool fish uh, by taking advantage of what we know about their biology to, to catch them, right? And so uh, when anglers are involved in a mark recapture program like this, it is the anglers themselves who catch the tagged fish, who collect the information, who submit it, who, uh, who participate. And what's even more wonderful about that is that, you know, we only have a handful of, of scientists uh, in a place like Saskatchewan working on fisheries science, but we have anglers spending, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of hours out on the water uh, and they can just uh, survey so many more fish than, than we can. Uh, and that collective effort can really provide a lot of information uh, for the betterment of, of fisheries management. And so the, that back and forth, that communication between my group and the anglers and the chance for them to report data firsthand, I think is a, a key part of the program for me. All right, so let's talk about tournament tagging. So we uh, collaborate with a, a fairly large number of tournaments, mostly in the Southern part of Saskatchewan. So with the Saskatchewan Walleye Trail and the Central Walleye Trail, as well as a number of independent tournaments. And what you see here is uh, a lineup of boats coming into the way station in Nipawin on Tobin Lake. And as a biologist, uh, a, a tournament format, whether it's uh, bringing fish into a way station or uploading images and data about fish in an app, to me, that is a gold mine because you have literally got people bringing you the information or bringing you the specimens to a central location. And if you think about the man hours I would have to put in to try to get even a subsample of all the fish that are gonna come in in an event like the Vanity Cup or the Premier's Cup on Tobin Lake, um, you know, it, it's just not possible for my crew to get that. And so uh, the tournament collaboration is a very valuable way to get access to a lot of fish or to a lot of information uh, in a very efficient manner. So we've been tagging fish on Tobin Lake for a few years now. And I'm going to talk about that first question, you know, what about the fate of fish? What happens to them after they're released? And uh, folks who have fished Tobin will know that there's a slot limit there. And there's uh, been a little bit of back and forth about you know, how does the slot apply to tournaments and uh, you know what happens to big fish everyone's worried about big fish when they're when they're released and so one of the things that we wanted to know is does size matter at the vanity cup you know are the big fish more likely to die or more likely to not be recaptured than the small fish right than the slot fish and so what you're looking at here is i promise the only graph i'm going to show but it basically gets at this question with fish from the vanity cup so if we focus your attention on the right side of the screen here, you'll see a, um, a red set of data, which shows you the size distribution of the fish that we tagged. So this happens to be 491 fish. Uh, that number grows all the time because we continue to collaborate with these events. But you can see there's basically two groups of fish. Here's your slot fish uh, on the bottom, and here's your uh, 70 and over um, on the top. And there's a couple of fish that kind of fall in the middle there that uh, slip through the, the cracks at the weigh station and um, there were always a, a few groups who run into problems getting disqualified there for not um, adhering strictly to the slot. But this is the size distribution of fish that we've tagged. Now if there was an issue with large fish, right, let's say large fish were more susceptible to um, dying as a result of catch and release stress, uh, we might expect not to see the same size distribution of fish in the ones that are reported recaptured by anglers. And the recaptured fish are on the left side of the screen here. You see them in blue. Uh, at this time when I made this graph, there were 76 fish that have been recaptured. And this is their size distribution. Uh, now there's many fewer than we tagged, which is normal. But what you see is that there is no difference between the 
blue graph and the red graph in terms of the size of the fish that are being caught. So what does that mean? It means that larger fish are in fact not being caught less often than expected. They're right on par with what you'd expect based on what we tag. And so the question is, does size affect the fate of fish at the Vanity Cup? And the answer is no, it does not, right? And so that is uh, a very simple data set um, that we can derive from that collaboration with tournaments and use of that T-bar technology. Second thing I want to talk about is movement and, you know, where do fish go after they're released? And this is something that keeps me personally awake at night is, you know, you watch the fish swim out of your hands, whether it's down a hole in the ice or it's off the side of the boat uh, and it leaves and you wonder where is that fish going to go and what is it going to do? And uh, that has been a central theme of what my research has tried to uh, address over the last uh, four or five years or so. So I'm going to use the Riverhurst Walleye Classic Tournament. Uh, as a case study to show you um, what we learn about where fish go as a result of recaptures. So Riverhurst is kind of central on Lake Diefenbaker. You can see Pallister Regional Park here circled in red. That is the location of the way station for the Riverhurst Walleye Classic. And you can see the approximate boundaries of the tournament as yellow dashed lines here, it's kind of the central part of, of Diefenbaker as a reservoir. So guys are fishing in that area. They're bringing fish to the way station at Riverhurst. We're tagging those fish and we're releasing them in Palliser Regional Park. And we sit back and wait, and where are they gonna get recaptured? Well, this next map shows you based on the warmth of the color. So hot means lots of fish. And as it cools down, it means less fish. Um, but what you can see is that there are a couple of hot spots around Palliser Regional Park and around Hitchcock Bay. Um, and then we have fish going all the way into the Saskatchewan River arm, up uh, all the way to Cotto Bay. We've got fish caught around elbow and then we've got um, kind of a warm spot in the capel arm and we've got fish going all the way west to beaver flat right so what does this tell us it tells us that fish that participate in the riverhurst tournament are in fact using the entire reservoir right, over the course of their um, of their lives and so when you ask you know what parts of beef and baker are important for walleye well the whole thing right and again uh very simple way of collecting data, but very effective at telling us that, you know, there's no such thing as a Riverhurst walleye. That Riverhurst walleye could have come from anywhere in the reservoir and in fact probably does spend time in a variety of different places. Last thing I want to talk about today are repeat customers. So, you know, we, we all undertake catch and release with the idea that we are um, putting a fish back into the fishery to contribute uh, subsequent times. But what do we really know about that? You know, the, the idea that, again, that the fish swims out of your hands and it's gone and you think to yourself that you've done a good deed and that that fish is going to continue to participate in the fishery uh, for, uh, for a time to come, but does it happen? And the answer is yes, it does happen. And we have uh, some really cool data on multiple recaptures of walleye in Saskatchewan. And I'm going to use this guy, uh, Walleye0917, as an example. You can see his tag. Um, I'm saying him, but I don't know if it's actually a male or a female. Uh, 917 was caught uh, as part of the Riverhurst Walleye Classic in June of 2017. And at that time, it was 45 centimeters long. We tagged the fish. We collect some data on it. It was recaught again a month later in July of 2017. It was caught a year after that in July of 2018, uh, almost a year after that in June of 2019. And then again in July of 2020. So this is a fish that's basically getting caught, um, got caught twice in its first year and then annually after that. So it's been released five times in four seasons, right? Think about that, five different times for the same fish in four fishing seasons. And the last time, sorry, the second last time it was captured, the angler collected a, a length measurement and it was 54 centimeters long. So it had grown nine centimeters over that, um, that time period. And we have a bunch of, now this is a, a, a you know, example of a high recapture rate. This is a fish from Diefenbaker. We have another fish from Tobin that's been caught and released five times as well. And of both of those lakes, we have fish that have been caught twice uh, or three times, um, probably over 20 fish uh, between the two locations that have been caught multiple times like that. So when you think about this, it's really an important finding because we have confirmation that, you know, not only do we put the fish back and they swim away, but they continue potentially to contribute twice, three times, four times, five times and beyond 
uh, to the recreational fishery in the province. And that's exactly what catch and release was designed to do. Right? And so um, very important to have that information in hand. Okay, what about ice fishing? So um, the walleye wars that we're that you know we're we're kind of talking about tonight are moving into the ice fishing context. Um, ice fishing is very poorly studied in any context. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think it might be because fisheries biologists don't like the cold, right? It's much nicer to be out in the summertime in a boat, um, you know, with some sunshine uh, rather than freezing your butt off in a tent uh, on a frozen lake. So we started winter uh, research in earnest in 2017 to try to close some of that gap. You can see our, our setup here. We started tagging fish that were being caught at ice tournaments and by ice anglers um, to try to, to, to bulk up knowledge about what happens to fish uh, that are caught in the winter. And once again, we are taking advantage of collaborations with tournaments because they bring lots of anglers out to play. Right. And so you see here um, some of the scenes from our, our winter research where you have anglers that are registering or anglers that are setting up um, and we can harness that um, ability of all those anglers to catch fish and to bring them to a central point uh, so that we can collect information on them. Right. And an app based tournament like we've been discussing so far today, again, the anglers collect the data themselves and the data come in electronically. So just a fantastic way of, uh, of generating data sets. And in fact, um, the picture you see on the right here, this was a fish that was just recently caught and reported uh, in the Capel chain, uh, a nice fish that we tagged in the summer. So what are we learning about ice fishing so far? Um, we are seeing crossover between winter and summer. And uh, you know, I think people would expect that, but it was something we needed to confirm. What do I mean by that? Fish we're tagging in the summer are showing up in the winter. People are catching them ice fishing. And, and fish that we catch and tag during the ice season are being caught during the summer, right? So they're crossing over between the different seasons. We see a lot fewer large fish during ice fishing research than we do during the summer. Not sure exactly why that is, um, but certainly be curious to hear what anglers have to say about it. Um, and so we're we're not collecting as much information about the about the big bruisers, about the you know the tournament winners. Um, ice fishing, catch and release. Winter biology of fish is totally a work in progress. Um, we need a ton of more information and there's a lot of time and investment that needs to go into uh, winter fishing uh, and understanding winter fisheries, um, you know, to get to the same place where we are with uh, open water seasons. Now I did get a report uh, just yesterday that I wanted to share with you guys. I just said we don't see many big fish uh, in the ice fishing season. This was a tagged fish that was just reported to me on January 5th, just yesterday. Uh, this is X036. You can see that green tag down in the bottom left corner here. Beautiful, uh, large walleye, over 70 centimeters, over 10 pounds, um, caught uh, on Tobin Lake. So we tagged that fish uh, during the Vanity Cup in 2019. And now, um, you know, more than uh, a year plus later, the same big fish uh, being caught through the ice. Right, so open water uh, for when it was tagged. Not only did the fish survive, but it's now being caught again uh, in a different fishing context. So very cool to see that. Um, we have identified some challenges. It's not all um, good news, and um, but I say challenges rather than bad news because I think challenges are things that we can work towards overcoming. We can use science, we can use education, we can use culture um, to try to address some of these challenges. So yes, there. Are, um, they're bad news, but not bad news in that we um, are unable to do something about it. Bad news in that we have some work to do. So what do we see happening in the ice fishing season at some of these tournaments and um, in some of the angling contexts that we work in? Barrel trauma is a big one. So fish coming up from deep water, uh, experiencing tissue damage. Um, you see the walleye here with the eyes popped out and the perch with the stomach coming out of its mouth. Um, symptoms of barrel trauma are fairly common in uh, fish. Uh, folks are often fishing relatively deep in the winter, but it's my uh, professional opinion that the effects of barrel trauma may actually be worse in the winter than they are in the summer. Something to do with the water temperature, but we don't know yet. Um, we also see some problems with deep hooking. You can see uh, this is a pike that came in at a nice fishing tournament, and you can see the hook sticking out from uh, behind its, uh, its gill plate here, still in place. Um, so deep hooks are often coming in 
And uh, this has to do with um, you know, still bait presentations, the tip ups, uh, the dead sticks, uh, and possibly not monitoring them closely enough because they're your second device. Uh, lastly, and probably one that's quite important is that, uh, you know, for catch and release, the fish need to go back in the water with as little damage as possible. And this is actually a photo off the dash of my truck from one of our, uh, rate, our acoustic tracking days on uh, Buffalo Pound Lake where we're chasing fish around under the ice. And you can see that the standing temperature is minus 38 C. And this is going to cause uh, near instantaneous freezing damage to any surface of a fish and also to a biologist, which is why um, I think fisheries biologists don't wanna be out there. Anyway, Shana's gonna talk a bit more about those, uh, those challenges. And of course, there's some logistic challenges to working in the winter. Uh, trucks get stuck, uh, students get upset when they have to dig the truck out. Uh, there's a lot of gear to move around and uh, it's just a whole different set of logistic challenges than we're used to uh, compared to open water research. And I guess the message I'll leave you with here is that we are really trying to get more into winter research and uh, would love to expand this program um, indefinitely, as long as I, I guess I can still muster up the strength to get out there. So I'm gonna stop there. I just wanted to say thank you to uh, all the folks who pay for uh, and support our research. Uh, in particular, I want to give a shout out to the um, Government of Saskatchewan's Fish and Wildlife Development Fund. Uh, they have been a major supporter of our research efforts. And of course, the revenue for that fund comes from hunting and fishing license sales. And so it's resource users who are indirectly paying for the research. Uh, but without that funding mechanism, we'd be uh, pretty much hooped in terms of um, being able to do things. And of course, there's a, a variety of other partners that I've listed here, um, not the least of which are the tournament organizers and, and the volunteers at those events that uh, facilitate our activities there. So I will stop there and I think uh, I am going to uh, turn it over to Shana and I will be happy to um, chat at the end of the uh, session. Sounds good, thank you, Chris. I'm just gonna get my screen shared here. All right, so as Chris mentioned, I'm going to talk to you guys about some best winter practices for ice angling. Um, I'm also an avid angler myself, and so I thought I'd throw this walleye in that at the time was my PB. I think you guys could all appreciate that. Um, so catch and release in, in the winter, um, especially the science around it. As Chris already mentioned, it is relatively new. Um, research on ice hasn't been happening for a very long time, and because of that, it's kind of ever evolving and ever changing. Um, so as more research is completed, we're getting more answers and sometimes those answers are changing. So all of the information from today's presentation is based on the current best available science, um, but it is possible that that could change over time. So ice angling season, um, it's kind of different compared to summer and there's a couple different reasons. So one is that there's very cold air. Um, as Chris mentioned with that minus 38 degrees Celsius, I don't really know anybody who loves being out when it's that cold. Um, the other thing is that often set lines or tip ups are used, which is not quite as common or common at all during the summer season. And as Chris already mentioned, ice access can be sometimes a challenge, um, but at the same time too, you don't have to have a boat or you're not restricted to shore during the cold water season. Um, you're able to actually get out to places that you might not be able to. Um, so it's kind of a little bit more accessible for um, multiple users. And so when it comes to ice angling and ice angling practices, there's kind of a gradient of concern that we have. So when we're looking at an issue or a certain behavior pattern, we're wanting to know, um, is it something that the fish won't survive or something that will result in that fish dying? And that's kind of referred to as mortality. Uh, the next stage down is the fish will survive, but with some lasting damage or impact. Um, that is what we call impairment, which is symbolized here by the slash. And then the other issues are maybe not quite as severe. They might not actually impact the fish physically, um, but it's more of kind of an ethics issue of, are we doing the best in, in providing the best possible welfare for the fish while we have them in hand? So with that said, I did want to touch on the issues that Chris brought up that we are seeing in ice angling, the three being barrel trauma, deep hooking and freezing damage. 
So first of all, barotrauma, um, if you're not aware of it already, it is when air is trapped in a fish's swim bladder. Um, and this occurs when there is a drastic pressure, press, pressure change. Um, and we do know that in water bodies and in lakes, there is a pressure doubling event that happens at approximately 30 feet. There isn't an exact depth for that. Um, but essentially when a fish is brought up from 30 feet, their swim bladder doubles in size. Um, small fish also appear to be more susceptible to barotrauma in winter. And some of the symptoms include positive buoyancy or fish that float, won't go back down the hole, um, Popeyes, swim bladder protruding out of the gills or the mouth, um, and that's kind of how you know you're dealing with barotrauma. So deep hooking is also an issue that can be uh, fatal to fish. Um, and that's essentially any time a hook is taken past the mouth of the fish. So once the trebles are entering the gill area or even further into um, the back of the mouth, um, that's what we would consider to be deep hooking. Um, and this is more likely to occur when bait is used, and it's also more likely to occur with set lines. When you combine bait and set lines, that makes it kind of the worst case scenario. And currently, um, deep hooking is the highest cause of mortality in winter catch and release. Most of this research has been done with pike, though, as not a lot of people um, use set lines for walleye. And forceful removal of deep hooks can damage internal organs. Um, the heart is actually very close to that back of the mouth, blood vessels, gill filaments being ripped. Um, those are kind of the, the main causes of the mortality when it comes to deep hooking. And so finally, the freezing of eyes, fins, and gills. I hope that the picture that I'm showing on the screen is not reality for most. Um, this is just one example of very extreme freezing. Um, but essentially what we're looking for here is damage to extremities from prolonged exposure to not only cold temperatures, but also wind. Wind is a major factor in increasing your freezing time. If you wanna put your wet hand out, um, it's probably not good for a fish either. And mostly this has potential to damage the, the eyes and the fins, which can impact swimming ability, eyesight, which obviously is needed to, to help with getting prey, and also the freezing of gill filaments can cause mortality in fish. And so I'm not going to leave you with just all of the bad. I also want to tell you, um, based on the current science, how best we can prevent these issues or minimize them. Um, so with barotrauma, as of right now, the only surefire way to avoid barotrauma is by fishing shallower than 30 feet. Um, it is uh, important to note that fish can still have barotrauma at depths less than 30 feet. Um, it's just less likely to happen because of that pressure doubling point. And once again, smaller fish do seem to have it more frequently, even in shallower depths. Um, but just if you're fishing less than, than 30 feet, it's, you're, you're less likely to run into barotrauma issues. With deep hooking, if you have set lines, um, be sure to frequently check them, um, especially if there's, they're baited. It just gives the fish less time to take that bait all the way back, and there's just less chance of having a deep hooking event. Um, there isn't any research for walleye in terms of if it's more beneficial to cut the line versus forcibly remove the hook. However, for pike, it is shown that cutting the line is much, much better than forcibly removing any, any trebles that are in place. So if you're able to unhook it without using a, a lot of force, definitely do that. It's better than leaving the hook in. But if you would have to kind of rip through anything to, to remove it, it will be better to, to leave the hook in place. And then also freezing, you can definitely cut down on air temperature by using a shelter, especially when paired with a heater. But another option is to use some sort of water container, which can be either an in-house or an in-ice live well, or you can also use um, something as simple as a Tupperware container from Dollarama, just something that holds water and allows you to keep that fish submerged when you de-hook it, when you're going between taking photos, going between measuring the fish, you're keeping that fish in water, minimizing the air exposure, but also if the water is liquid, you know that it's not at a freezing temperature and that fish is also going to be protected. And these are not necessarily things that will be a huge issue when it comes to fish dying versus fish surviving. Um, but this is kind of where it comes into that welfare of, you know, have all your stuff close by, 
make sure that you have your pliers on hand, your measure boards right beside you, and just kind of keep that fish uh, out of water for as minimal time as possible. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of our funding partners. Um, obviously the Fish and Wildlife Development Fund, um, Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation and MyTax have also contributed to, to my research as well. And the Saskatchewan Sport Fish Research Group Facebook page, if you don't already follow us there, we share lots of research updates. All right, that was a fascinating pre presentation. Thanks to both uh, both you, Chris and Shana. Uh, I know I've got lots of questions about uh, about uh, uh, the some of the things that uh, Chris was saying, uh, in particular the barotrauma and descending devices. But I'll wait till the the end of the the uh, the uh, call to uh, to jump into those. Um, so I guess uh, uh, I guess uh, I'll just reiterate. Uh, it, uh, we're really interested to hear what uh, anglers are thinking about these things. Is there anything that's jumping out at you as a question or or curious about uh, 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 some aspect of the research? Like to see more of? Um, if you can add your your questions and comments to the chat box, or uh, I see there's a Q and A section as well. Uh, either one though of those should work. That'd be great. So I guess I'll, I'll uh, pass it back to Shana at this stage. And just to, to differentiate, uh, uh, we've recently brought Shana on onto our staff as part of our team for science communication. So uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we asked her to do is, is basically go through all the data that we were able to collect through Walleye Wars and uh, provide a quick summary overview of uh, what that data looks like. And again, if anyone has any questions, uh, we encourage you to ask them uh, through, the, through the chat box. So back to you, Shana. Thank you. All right, I will share my screen again. Just let me get this up here. There we go, now it's an option. Okay, can everyone see the presentation now? I hope so. Yeah, it looks All good right. from here. Okay, perfect, thank you. So yes, as Sean mentioned, um, I am going to give you guys a summary of the data that was collected um, by the tournament anglers for Walleye Wars 1, 2, and 3. I'm gonna keep this pretty brief so we can have a really long question answer period, um, but definitely let me know if you have any questions or comments and we can get to them at the end. So I wanted to start with the fact that um, the goal is to share the scientific data that is collected by the tournament anglers during the tournament. Um, but I did want to start off by saying there are limitations to this data, um, primarily that the size, um, the length data that I'm going to be sharing um, doesn't reflect natural populations at this time. There is definitely still a bias to reporting larger fish as opposed to reporting uh, the entire range that people are catching. And that is one of the reasons why Anglers Atlas has a lottery fish prize. Um, we really want to encourage you guys to consider um, submitting all of the fish that are caught during the tournament. Um, this really allows us to have a more accurate view of what's happening in the lakes. Um, so there is just some, some limitations with our interpretation of the data that I'm gonna show you today. So to start with some um, length data summaries. So I have a, a quick table here of the three tournaments with the smallest walleye that was reported at each tournament, the average size, and then also the largest, um, which is your winning fish for each tournament. So for Walleye Wars 1, the smallest walleye um, that was reported was 21.5 centimeters. The average size was 47 centimeters and the largest being 82.4. Um, for anybody with a judge ruler board, you'll know that the uh, it only starts at 30 centimeters and those fish were, were marked in our system as one centimeter and were not kind of included for, for these summary um, of the smallest anyways. So that's another reason why we have limitations with our length data is because we can't accurately determine just from the photo um, any fish that is shorter on those boards. We do have the capability to go back and kind of insert a ruler on top of the photo and possibly pull that data out in the future. Um, but just to continue, so for Walleye Wars 2, the smallest walleye re uh, reported to us was 26 centimeters. The average was 46.2. 
and the largest was 74.9. And so that was the tournament that was only on Last Mountain Lake. And then finally for Walleye Wars 3, which is once again back to the entire province, the smallest recorded was 18 centimeters. The average was 50.1, so a little bit higher than the previous two. And then that largest fish was 84.2. Congratulations again, Mike, that's an awesome walleye. So for Walleye Wars 1, um, I think we actually had 24 members, but it's pulling up 23 that entered fish into our database. Um, there's 10 different water bodies that fish were submitted for during this tournament. Um, and the anglers who reported had a cumulative 676 hours on the water during the span of that tournament. Um, and so that just really highlights how much effort is going into it. And there were 1,792 fish logged over the span of that tournament, which ran from August 1st to 31st. And this is what the length distribution looks like. This is a very simple diagram, just the a number of fish on the, the column and the length across the bottom. And so we see quite a large range going from down to the 21.5 all the way up to your 82.4, a um, little bit more kind of in the middle, but that's how the fish looked from the tournament. And then finally, I wanted to just share the uh, spread of water bodies that were participated in um, the tournament. So each black circle indicates a water body where fish were submitted at some point throughout the, the length of the tournament. Um, there is no automatic locations. There's no kind of ind indication of density or frequency of that lake being visited. Um, it's just, I just thought it was really neat to see the, the spread or the reach of the tournament um, that was province-wide. And so going into Wally Wars 2, we had 48 people reporting fish to us through the app with the only one water body because it was Last Mountain. We had 410 hours and 1,010 fish total. And so this is what that length distribution looked like. Once again, with the judge ruler boards, we do get that drop off at the 30 centimeters, but it's fairly spread out. Um, and kind of once again, that higher slot to smaller than slot size or undersized fish. And finally for Walleye Worst 3, we had 77 people reporting over 12 water bodies with 1,150 hours logged and 2,099 fish uh, over the span of the tournament, which was October 9th to November 1st. And this is what our length distribution looks like here. So we are kind of seeing two peaks um, with a really sharp drop off once again after that 30 centimeter mark, um, but this is, how the lengths show up for that tournament. And then here was the spread of the lakes that were participated in. I did just want to note that the black dot that is currently in Alberta is not actually coming from somebody submitting fish from Alberta. That dot represents the North Saskatchewan River and it's just an arbitrary point along that system so as not to give any location away. So I promise you there wasn't anybody in Alberta that was participating. Um, that spot's meant to indicate that fish were um, logged from the North Saskatchewan River. Um, so really cool spread once again all the way from the southeast corner of the province to the, the northwest as well. And so one thing I did want to touch on is that we do collect information on catch rate or scientifically catch per unit effort, um, but we have very low uptake of tournament anglers that are ending their trips at the end of the day. Um, and that results in a really, really bad bias in the data set. So we aren't currently able to show you the three highest catch per unit efforts or catch rates from each tournament. Um, but that's something we would definitely love to share with you guys in the future. So if that's something that you're interested in seeing who's catching the most fish in the least amount of time, uh, definitely I would encourage you and your friends to make sure that you're finishing those trips because um, we would love to, to share this information with you if we can make it a little bit more accurate. And so finally, I just wanted to leave you guys with a couple questions, and I believe that we're going to try to leave this slide up during the question and answer period as well. Um, but this is some kind of prompts for where we would like to, or we want to know where you guys would like to see this data going. Um, so we want to know what sort of data is most interesting to you guys as anglers. Um, if there's any of these data metrics that you'd like to see explained in more detail, um, if there's any other data that we didn't share with you today that you would be interested in seeing. 
And then also, um, what types of things would you like to see done with the data? And I believe that Sean should be able to jump on here and provide any clarity. And then Chelsea is going to be moderating our questions. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. I love seeing the summary of all the data we were collecting. Yeah, and hats off to all the anglers that were willing to share their, their data this season. And at this point, uh, I'll pass it off to Chelsea Crandall. Um, Chelsea's uh, involved with fisheries, uh, very different fisheries down in, uh, in uh, uh, I think, Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic uh, and the Atlantic Ocean. So Chelsea, uh, I'll pass it off to you. Yes, I am way down here in Florida. <laughs> so quite different. So we have a question and I apologize if I pronounce any names wrong. Uh, while we're going through this, if you have any questions, please toss them in the chat or that Q&A and, and I'll throw them to the group. Um, but we have a question from Joe Tilly about fizzing. What about fizzing? And I don't know who wants to take that one. I believe that one is directed at me, so I will go ahead and take that question. Um, so fizzing, if anybody isn't aware, is the practice of inserting a needle into the swim bladder of a fish who is suffering from barotrauma as a relief method, method to relieve the air. Um, as I said, this research is currently ongoing and also evolving. There isn't a clear answer right now if that is actually beneficial to fish. Um, kind of one of the main reasons is that releases the air and allows the fish to submerge back down the hole. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of study as to if that fish survives after it's back under the ice. Um, so based on the current science, um, the only surefire way is to just try to fish less. So we don't have a clear answer right now on, on if fizz fizzing is a um, viable relief method long-term for fish. Yeah, yeah, Chelsea, I'd like to, uh, to ask a question uh, specifically relate, relate to the barotrauma. So we're, we work on a number of projects across the country, and one of the projects we're working on is with rockfish on the West Coast, and they suffer with a similar uh, problem of barotrauma. And sometimes they're, but they, like they come up sometimes from depths of 100, 200, 300 feet, and uh, they experience the same sort of uh, uh, illustrations that uh, uh, Chris and Shana were, were talking about. Uh, on the West Coast, uh, they've now implemented a rule that uh, all fishing boats must carry what's called a descending device. And there's a couple of these types of devices uh, 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 or models. Uh, one's called a sequelizer, which releases a clamp at a certain depth. I'm wondering if that's been tested at all in, in Saskatchewan or for walleye fisheries at all, or, or if you've heard anything about uh, either Chris or Shana about uh, the usefulness of uh, descending devices. I'm gonna pass that one off to you, Chris. I was gonna say, I'll, I could jump in here since uh, Shana handled the fizzing question. So um, yeah, we have done a fairly broad spectrum review, all species, all contexts, so marine and freshwater, um, and descending devices do offer some benefit for sure. And it tends to vary uh, based on the situation. So the severity of the barotrauma, the fish species involved in the context. Um, but yeah, some fish like rockfish do come up from deep death um, looking pretty gnarly with, uh, you know, their stomach sticking out of the mouth and their eyeballs popped out of the skull and um, returning them to a depth of neutral buoyancy quickly with a descending device does seem to improve their survival. But um, it's really not uh, a number that you can point to and say what that percentage is. So if you were to say to me, uh, you know, Sean, if you were to ask what percentage of rockfish survive after being caught at 300 feet and then released on a descending device, um, I would not be able to give you an answer to that. And I think that's really one of the big unknowns. And also one of the big unknowns that we as anglers need to kind of put some uh, investment into thinking about, you know, what would be an acceptable number for us, right? So if I were to say that, you know, 50% of rockfish that you release on a descending device survive and 50% die, would that be good enough? Um, you know, would we want it to be 90? Um, anyway, there's a lot wrapped up in that question. So um, in terms of walleye, we have published one study examining what happens to walleye after they are fizzed, descended, or um, just released. And uh, interestingly enough, um, there are some big behavioral changes that happen from fizzing, but the fish uh, survived at least over a short period of time. Um, but quite a small data set, 
and that was a summer fishery, not ice. So, um, you know, Shana kind of nailed it by saying that we don't really know much about what happens uh, under the ice with barrow chum. Great, thanks. And we have another question from Brent Myers that says, what's your best guess as to why while while I travel so far in lakes, specifically on Lake and my goodness, I don't know how to pronounce this one, Dyfin Baker? Sorry, y'all. <laughs> oh, come on, Chelsea. That was a famous Canadian prime minister, Dyfin Baker. I know, I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could try to field that one. So um, I'm going to put this in terms that I think we all think about. So I, I often think about what motivates me to move um, and to cover large distances. And I can tell you that I will move for food. I will move if I'm not comfortable in my current environment. And I will move very long distances for sex. And I think fish do the same thing. Uh, I'm not sure which of those is motivating the fish um, that we are looking at. Probably a combination of a variety of those things. So water temperature, quality and habitat, availability of prey, and then uh, some of it will be whether or not the recapture occurs in proximity to the spawn. So I think that uh, it's basically uh, food conditions and sex. Sorry, I didn't mean to give any insight into what drives my behavior on a daily basis, but. <laughs> All right, so we have another question from Joe Tilly, who says, you guys are doing a great job in SAS. That being said, do you share your information with other provinces like Alberta because they need help? I guess that's me again. Um, so <laughs> the answer is um, yes, we do share information. Uh, we do it in a number of different ways. Uh, formally, we do it by publishing papers, which are then accessible to anybody who wants to see them. Uh, including anglers. If you guys are interested in publications, uh, I'm always more than happy to send uh, files and PDFs out to folks if they want to read those. Um, we communicate very directly with government scientists in Saskatchewan and in a roundabout way, uh, they communicate with those in Alberta. Uh, and we do that also in a more formal context through something called the Great Plains Fisheries Workers Association, which um, has a conference every year uh, in which managers meet and talk about uh, challenges and that sort of thing. So um, I guess the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, I would say that there's always more room for communication and maybe um, you know, a little more collaboration, I'd say, especially when you have interconnected province, uh, provincial waterways like we do uh, in central Canada. But uh, we do talk to each other, um, whether it comes through in policy or knowledge, I'm not sure, but we, we try. So I'm still watching this chat if anyone has any other questions or if any of our, our panelists have any questions. Yeah, I'll... I was really, really interested in the, the recapture distribution data that uh, you had, Chris. Uh, so this is the first time I've ever seen uh, what the recapture distribution looks like. Uh, and it looks like it, it's really quite similar to what your, your uh, tagging distribution was. And uh, uh, I'm just wondering if, if you can elaborate a little bit on, on what your thoughts are on that. Uh, uh, in terms of survivability and, and uh, yeah, just, just uh, curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so that uh, was for one particular event that we've worked at for a number of years. That's the Vanity Cup, which is a, a fall tournament on Tobin Lake. And at that particular event, we see a very, very nice matchup between um, the distribution tagged and the distribution recaptured. And uh, I think that is probably a reflection of the fact that, um, you know, the, I guess, if we look at it from kind of first principles, it basically means that there's no difference in who's being tagged and who's being recaptured. And what I interpret that to mean is that the size of the fish is not influencing the probability of recapture, um, suggesting that, you know, the, the fish are surviving across the board in terms of the different, uh, the different size categories. We do have a couple of events where the distributions don't match as well. And uh, that suggests to me that there is some sort of problem, um, but we have to wait for a little more data to come in to, to kind of figure out who's missing from the, the recapture pool. Um, it's sort of a murder mystery before we can figure out what's going on there. So I guess the short answer, Sean, is that uh, I think it's really just a reflection of the fact that the fish size is probably not as big a factor as I thought it might be, that it's other things that uh, affect the probability of recapture. Great, thanks. 
Thanks, Chris. And, and Shana, um, one thing I'm curious about in terms of uh, safe uh, practices and fish handling, can you share a little bit about uh, when, when you're catching a fish, uh, the usefulness of, of the, uh, the, the gloves? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I didn't touch on that in my presentation, but one of the other ways that we um, can help minimize air exposure specifically is by using cotton handling gloves. So luckily I actually have one right here on my desk. Um, they are very inexpensive. You can get them in like 20 packs from all sorts of places. Um, I think we get ours from Canadian Tire or PD Mart or something like that. Um, but they are inexpensive and essentially they allow you to keep hold of the fish better, um, especially because fish are wet, they're covered in their slime coating. Um, and the cotton handling gloves just kind of helps you keep a better hold on the fish. It can help prevent you from dropping them, which obviously increases the amount of time they're out of water. Um, and it's just another way to, to kind of help you handle the fish um, effectively and, and keep that time minimized. Logan Lewis would like to know, are acoustic tags still being used or is it mostly the T-bar tags now? I think that's me. So um, we, so acoustic tags are um, incredibly expensive and labor intensive for us to work with. And so we are right now focusing on T-bar tags. I can just jump in too. And if, if anybody has Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the short answer is that we do a combination of both, but we do much less acoustic tagging just because of the cost and the intensity of the study. So we had uh, acoustic tags running up until 2019. We had to take a break during the COVID year, um, but we're hoping to have acoustic tags up and running again in uh, 2021. Nice. And we have a question that was sent to Jim. Um, is there any other information Chris, Chris or Shana would like anglers to provide going forward? I could really, really use some information on, uh, you know, how to make a lot of money in a short period of time. But uh, other than that, um, you know, they, I think that when folks submit their tag reports to me, um, you know, the, the things we're interested in are what happened to the fish? Was it released or was it kept for the frying pan? Um, where was it caught approximately? We don't need to know the secret, you know, the honey hole or anything like that, but where was it caught approximately the date it was caught? Um, one of the things that we often miss out on is a length and a weight measurement. So if anglers have a chance to, uh, to collect that information, that'd be great. It's not necessary. Um, you know, ideally, uh, if you want to get the fish back in the water quickly and you're worried about it, you know, by all means, send it back into the water. Don't worry about the, the length and the weight. But um, that's what a complete record looks like to me. So what happened to the fish? Was it caught? Was it kept or released? Uh, where was it caught? What date was it caught? And what was its length and mass? That's a full um, record. I love to see pictures of the fish and the tags. And so I almost always ask anglers when they send me an email, did you take any pictures? And then we have a good back and forth because most of the time they do because it's rare to catch a tag fish. And I just like to see the fish again and see what the tag looks like and have a bit of a chat. So um, that's all from my end. All right, I'll move to this question from Bob Kirkpatrick who says, how does the data from fish recorded on the MyCatch app compare to test netting and what about the mortality issues with both systems? So I believe that question is for me. Um, I'm assuming that you're referring to provincial test netting data when you're asking that question. Um, and I have not compared the MyCatch data to that currently, so I, I can't say yet, um, but that's definitely something um, that I could table to look into. So I'm gonna write that down. And then um, in terms of mortality issues with both systems, I think that's something that um, we might not be able to answer with our data currently, how it's set up, um, simply because we're not really keeping track of harvest um, of the fish being entered, but also from a tournament context, um, we're not doing anything in terms of tracking the fish through the app. Um, mortality issues can be addressed through the tagging program that Chris is running, um, but currently um, from the Angler's Atlas side anyways, we're, we're unable to determine that. 
Yeah, and if I can just add into that, uh, that was a really big question. Uh, I think when uh, I came out to Saskatchewan for the first time, we, we did our first test in, I think it was 2019 uh, at Last Mountain Lake. Uh, we wanted to see, is the data we're collecting from the app similar to data that we're getting from test netting? And we had put in a number of proposals uh, for 2020 where we were actually going to run head-to-head -head tests where we were going to look at the MyCatch data versus actual test netting to see if our distributions were similar. <laughs> Unfortunately, COVID hit and all the test netting that we were hoping to work with uh, basically got canceled. So we weren't able to run that test. But that's a really good question, Bob. And, and that's something we're looking forward to. And hopefully we can find some partners either in Saskatchewan or Alberta or, or one of our one of the jurisdictions uh, that we're working with where we can actually do some head to head comparisons, because that's a really important uh, question that I think we can answer. And, and if we're able to then catch the fish, measure them and then quickly release them. Uh, potentially it can be a, a, a big difference in terms of conservation because every fish that's caught by an angler is quickly released. I mean, our goal is to have them all released within one minute and uh, all those fish go back swimming. So, so certainly uh, uh, when we get more information on that, we'll pass that information on to you. All right, question from Michael Mason. With the Buffalo Pound data, why are the walleye spending so much more time near the causeway? Are there any more videos that will be shared from the Buffalo Pound research? I think I have to flip the question back on the, on the angler. Um, maybe you could tell me why they're spending so much time near the causeway. I really am not sure. Um, I, I have a suspicion it might have to do with the flow of water into that system and the fact that the northwestern part of the lake is receiving the fresher water from the Capel River. Um, and I, as you move uh, kind of southeast down the lake, it gets shallower and potentially the water quality is less suitable for walleye. But I really don't know. Um, you know, I watch those uh, those animations of the fish movement, too, and I wonder what the heck is going on here. So um, and short answer is that, yes, we can certainly post some more uh, animations of fish moving on Buffalo Pound if folks are interested in that. There's a question in the chat too, as well from Scott. Uh, Will Angler's Atlas be doing any other species tournaments in Saskatchewan outside of walleye? Um, I guess I can answer that one a little bit. The, the first comment I'll make is we absolutely can. Uh, we're not restricted to walleye by any means. We've done other species across different parts of Canada and uh, in, in the States as well. Um, there's no technology wise, we can absolutely do it. The, uh, there's a couple things that come into play there. As we know in Saskatchewan, there's uh, a lot fewer species than in some other provinces, especially compared to like Ontario or BC. Um, that doesn't, and, and I think the audience for that type of event is a lot smaller, which, which is totally fine. Doesn't mean we can't run a smaller event, but that's one thing to consider. But probably more importantly, especially, and this is specific to pike and perch, is uh, measurements because um, most of us have the proper equipment to measure walleye and we kind of know the range of you know what they're going to come into in terms of measurements but uh for opposite reasons pike and perch you know it's pretty easy to or it's pretty common that uh a pike will will outstretch your judge board or conversationally uh or conversely a, a perch will not reach the minimum limit so it becomes a a bit of a challenge for these catch foot release measure based tournaments when you're dealing with either very large species or very small so that's the main reason why it's kind of a challenge. Um, and I've been asked a few times too about uh, trout. And again, sort of, the, sort of the same thing there, but the biggest thing, th those are kind of the two biggest things is that there's a, there's a limited audience for one, but also the, the measurements become an issue when a uh, number of people that have the proper equipment to take those measurements. I mean, most people are set up to weigh a fish, but our tournaments are all measure based. So that's the biggest reason we haven't gone there yet in Saskatchewan, but it certainly doesn't mean that it won't happen. That is all the questions I see coming up. There's a few ideas thrown out. Todd Smith proposes maybe bait, fish, and forage being concentrated coming through the causeway could be at play um, with that buffalo pound, I'm guessing. But if there's no more questions, maybe, Sean, it's time to throw it back to you for a wrap-up. 
Sounds great. Thank you very much, Chelsea. And uh, thank you everyone for participating tonight. This has been really quite interesting. Uh, it's been a learning experience for us, certainly. Uh, I think the one hour limit maybe uh, is a little too short uh, for the future ones, probably go to 90 minutes. I think that's probably a good time span. And uh, what we'll be doing is uh, we'll be sending out a survey to all the participants uh, just to get your feedback on this. Again, this was our first uh, try at this. Uh, we're kind of on shaky legs, just uh, making sure it, it went well. And, and certainly any feedback we can get from, from the uh, participants uh, would be uh, greatly appreciated. And what we hope is the, this is the first of many of these uh, tournament talks where we connect the science and the angling community for a, really an important two-way dialogue where we can share what we're learning as, as research scientists and anglers can share a lot of their experience. And, and in particular, I'm all, all, always interested on what sort of data is of most interest. Uh, so when we're uh, collating this information, what would you like to see and, and how frequently would you like to see it? Is this something we should be able to put back in the, in the app? Uh, should it appear uh, maybe after you catch a fish, maybe we can provide some, some details about uh, uh, some data about, about the, uh, the tournament. Um, really interested to know what, what would be of interest from an angling perspective. So uh, certainly eager to hear from all, everyone. And without, uh, I don't think there's anything else to say other than and, uh, good night and thank you for coming and we'll pick it up again uh, the next go round. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>